and welcome back. It is the Danny Dot Podcast. This is pod number 45, guys. 45. And did I think I'd be talking about dating in the 45th pod? Absolutely not. Uh, I feel like I wrapped up the previous pod on, um, you know, quite a quick note. I wasn't really prepared for getting the coughs halfway through. <laughs> I was coming down with a sore throat. Blame the Friday night before. But anyway, I apologize. I am a fit bill of health, health now, so I'm ready to come into this pod all guns blazing and let us in on all the fun stuff that's been happening as my little Danny Dot community. Um, this is a weird topic for me because it's something I'm not very familiar or confident in. I'm just genuinely going on my own experiences most recently. Um, I have been having a lot of fun the last six to eight weeks and I don't know where it's come from, but I am embracing everything. I honestly would say I've, I'm not doing anything differently. I've just probably come to realization about a few things and I've just embraced it. So let's kick this off. I have the worst track record when it comes to men. I could probably count on one hand how many guys I've ever sort of been attracted to, fancied, uh, been involved with <laughs> um, prior to coming back from Hawaii. So honestly, there's no history there. Uh, and a lot of people have said to me, you know, your podcast is quite a personal thing, but you never talk about your love life. I think in my own life, I have all my ducks in a row except love. So that's something that's very foreign and I run in the other direction when I think about it. I am a gangly six foot three chicky who is like a baby giraffe. Honestly, I will put my feelings aside for everyone else to enjoy themselves. I never vocalize if anyone's hot. If I'm at a bar or a nightclub, I've never really said, oh, I'm going to go and approach that person and give them my number, blah, blah, blah zero confidence. I will watch that shit from afar. I will hook up all my mates. I will have those conversations. Just never about myself. <laughs> I am just, I don't know, falling into this whole zone at the moment where I want to be me. And it's so wonderful to watch. I was only telling a friend yesterday about some things that got up to on the weekend. And she was like, where has this come from? And I was like, I don't know. I do not know. All I'm going to say is I'm embracing having a bit of fun and maybe more or less put it down to the fact that I've taken the pressure off myself. There has been a lot of pressure from a very young age. I have some very big voices in my family. Uh, my uh, godmother, who I'm going up to Nelson to be at her 60th in about two weeks' time, Honestly, between her and my mum, they're pests. <laughs> They've always said, if you ever meet someone, get ready to introduce them to us. And that pressure is something that if you have kids, don't ever tell them that. Don't ever say that you need to put pressure on them meeting someone that's worthy of bringing into the family circle. I don't know. I feel like I've, for 30 odd years, I've looked at guys and been like, I don't want to introduce you to friends or family. Let's just move this shit along. Like, and honestly, it it weighs on you. So I honestly would say that recently I've started looking at guys a little bit differently and I don't really care because if it, they compliment my lifestyle and they make me feel good, you're going to have to like them because I like them. <laughs> so I would say that that would be a definite turn in everything at the most recently, but uh, is there guys that I wouldn't introduce to anyone? No. No, I'm really proud of who I have been heading out with lately, that's for sure. Anyway, let's take this back to 96 where I got married on the jungle gyms in uh, primary school to a guy that I am pretty sure I've seen his Facebook in the last five years and I'm not impressed with myself. <laughs> um, I don't know how that came about and I feel like it was a bad omen on my dating history because even though like it came out of nowhere and I have no real reason as to why I married this bloke. Um, it was 96. What were we doing? Why are we dating and, and doing all these types of weird shit when we're younger anyway? We've got no responsibilities. We're supposed to be out there having fun and that's exactly what my mum saw in all this. Even in uh, intermediate, I can't even say that I thought anyone was fancied as attractive. Um, I will look at people and think, oh, no, I'm not attracted to that. And I think I have a type. So <laughs> um, it wasn't until I went down to Queenstown. God help us. Mum ripped me out of high school in Christchurch because a couple of my friends fell pregnant. 
And mum was just saying, oh, you know, there are guys here that you're not going to fall pregnant to. They are scum drop kicks. They're all just learning how to have sex up in Christchurch and falling pregnant. So no. Mum started dating this guy in Queenstown. We moved down. He had a hot son. Um, it was probably the first time I actually thought, oh, he's quite good looking. He was arrogant as shit and he touched his cousin's pink bits, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, it's just been one of those lives that I just look at now and I'm like, what the frig? Um, I was hated in high school in Queenstown. Not going to lie about that. Uh, the girls hated me because I lived with considering, uh, you know, they thought he was the hot guy. Oh. He had four friends. They all lived near us in Arthur's Point. Um, and I got along with all of them, which they hated me for. Uh, in hindsight, I look back and I'm like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> they're all still on my Facebook and they're all still good friends with me. So I don't know. I must do something right. And I think one of the things that I'm really proud of is that I always just friend zone good people. To me, the guys were good. They're friends, nothing more. But I, I value their friendship more than these catty females who, to this day, I will be out in Queenstown and one of them will yell something crass across the bar at me. So small minds, small minds. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until my mum's relationship down there fell apart, I ended up in Australia. And that's when I met my best mate, who you guys know is a guy. And I look at sometimes and I'm like, you know, for 20, 20 years, I haven't had to date anyone because I have this really great best mate who's a bloke who kind of fills the male cup as, in a sense, not romantically, but if he if I need something fixed, he fixes it. He fixes it over the phone. I, he doesn't um, necessarily need to even be here. And we've been long distance friends for 17 years. So in hindsight, I look back and I'm like, I didn't need to date anyone. I never thought of myself going out to gay bars and everything because he's gay that I was ever going to meet my husband at a drag show and it wasn't until I went to a therapy session that the therapist actually said to me oh Danny you're not going to meet your husband at a drag show so you're going to have to like start putting yourself out there to like people's um, sporting events and things where you might meet someone that you've got the same interest with. <laughs> I was like, oh, isn't that funny? I'm not going to meet my husband at a drag show unless he's in a, in a dress. <laughs> but honestly, I look back and I'm like, yeah, that was some really fine words. Um, but yeah, that was primary school. So we were still quite young. Uh, no, not primary school, sorry, fourth form. Uh, I finished high school. Can't even say I walked out of that school with any sort of qualifications came back to Queenstown and it wasn't until I was actually turning 18 um, and I met a guy behind a bar at the Frank Arms Tavern. Until I was 22, we were a whole situation ship. Uh, my brother was very good friends with him before I was. Um, they, on Just on a random whim, Tom decided to catch a trip up to the remarkable ski field and he, this bartender was the driver of this red ute. <sighs> If I could look back at all that time spent with him, I'm like, what the frig, Danny? Um, we still, we were never exclusive. There's a lot of conversations around it just because of what, how we were as, you know, what we were. <laughs> uh, I thought the sun shone out of his ass, as you do when you're kind of young and you just want to like drink the free drinks and stay out late. He was the perfect example. Um 10 o'clock at night, he'd knock off from the Frankton Arms Tavern. We'd go into Queenstown. We'd sit on the balcony at Bardot, drink Lake Chalice uh, Merlot red wine, have a cheese board, have a Malibu and Dry Chaser, smoke cigars until 4 in the morning, and then I'd go back to his house. His apartment behind the Frankton Arms Tavern, his bed hung off chains off the roof. <laughs> I still look back now and I'm like, what the frig? Um, but he was the love of my life. I doted on everything about this guy. It wasn't until he moved on from the fats and he started bartending in Queenstown that he got deported for selling B-class drugs to an undercover cop and got uh, basically banned from New Zealand for 10 years. To me, that was kind of like the ending of everything. You, I wasn't allowed to have contact with him. It was just cut off. Everything turned to shit. I had no closure. I felt like I was just like that was the end of it. And it's not fair because 
I was having so much fun. You know, we'd take these trips, we'd stay in hotels, we'd we were just like Bonnie and Clyde without being like naughty. <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose he was naughty. My mum was very open and honest about that relationship. I was telling her, you know, I don't I don't really remember him dealing drugs or getting me involved with drugs, but um he was definitely one of those people that was like a big ringleader of Queenstown. Um after all that sort of settled down, I moved to Christchurch and there was this bar on Oxford Terrace called The Mad Cow. And it wasn't until a night out that uh, I was on a pub crawl and uh, I met this guy. And The Mad Cow was considered a bar that if you hadn't met someone by 4 a.m., kind of like the TARDIS bar in Queenstown, then you weren't going to meet someone. So <laughs> I met this guy and he was such, oh, he was beautiful. I just don't even know where he came from. I think he was standing at the bar. I was on the dance floor and he came and danced with me. No conversation whatsoever, just dancing. We took a couple of photos of us making out on the dance floor and he was probably been the one guy that I've ever changed my Facebook photo to of me and him kissing. And I don't even know why I did it. We weren't Facebook friends. He didn't have social media. Um, I think I was just proud. I was like, look, mum, look what I got. <laughs> um but yeah, it turned out he had a girlfriend and we had to keep our texting quite secret. Again, still not exclusive with any sort of situation, just a piece on the side. Um, so I I kind of turfed it in a little bit. I actually ended up with an injury on my left wrist where I fell off the bar at the mad cow dancing at a foam party. And I had to move back to Queenstown because for two years I was off work with this metal rod in my wrist and I had to get back on my feet with work and everything. And uh, we ended up, moving me back to Queenstown and I don't know, I kind of just like ginned around and did my own thing. Still no one really worth talking about. <laughs> Moved to Australia. Um, was in Sydney and a, a friend of mine who came out of the woodwork declared his love for me over Snapchat and uh, my whole world tipped upside down because I thought this guy's only ever liked me. Like we've had conversations and I thought he was a friend. I've even given him like love advice and now he's telling me that he can't stop thinking about me and we have to, like, be in a relationship, um, all whilst being over Snapchat. So there's a bit of history for me in Snapchat. I friggin' hate that app. It's just it's disgusting and obnoxious. I was in a long-distance situationship with him for about three years. He, again, had a girlfriend uh, in Queenstown, I think. Um, and it wasn't until I was actually moving back from... Australia to New Zealand that his mum whisked him away so he moved to Australia it's like two trains in the night just crossing <laughs> um, I was livid to be quite frank and it's funny because I have these two rose quartz crystals and I've had them for like 15 years I swear to you guys every time I touch them he will come out of the woodwork and message me on social media and I don't know what that's about so I've thought about giving them the biff but rose quartz is rose quartz, and it's meant to, like, inflict love or something. I don't know. I don't think I'll ever really have said I love that guy. I just think he was kind of hot. <laughs> and now I look back and I'm like, what was I doing? But um, in a weird kind of way, I think he gave me a lot of confidence because even when I was living in Queenstown and he was being a little bit cheeky with me, I got drunk one night and I snapchatted him my boobs. <laughs> I then deleted the app, so I've never really been quite sure if he ever saw that snap. But I feel like I kind of initiated it. Empowering is all fuckery, I know. But when we were in that weird situation thing for three years, he was the one giving me body confidence to snap parts of my body and be a little bit more frisky and promiscuous uh, in front of the camera. So, I mean, I suppose everyone kind of brings their own traits to the table, but that wasn't really for me. And uh, it wasn't until I moved out to Central Otago in the outskirts here in Cromwell that I thought, I'm just going to kind of like get a feel for the township themselves and just take a step back and meet a few people and this, that and the other, you know, give everyone the benefit of the doubt. But honestly, with everything that's kind of happened and then just going away to Hawaii and coming back, there's been this complete shift. I don't know what's been going on. I actually read my gratitude journal thingy that I started writing in before I left for Hawaii. Obviously, when you're doing the 75 hard, you've got to have a real mental clarity on, on this, that, and the other. 
So this is just an insert from day what is it, 66 of that. So nearing near the end of 75, this is what I wrote. As I'm waking up, I envision myself to feel refreshed and energized. I'm very proud of the past 66 days of my 75 hard journey. I feel so healthy and happy. This is really my best season yet. I don't believe I've attracted the love I've been dreaming of, but I'm open to searching for it now. And then, probably like, I don't know, what's this, six days later, <laughs> I wrote a manifesting my husband list, <laughs> which this cracks me up. I don't even know why, but what's that? One, two, three, six, nine... So there's 12 dot points, obviously tall, dark, confident in himself, adventurous, playful, accommodating to my needs, loving with a beard, kind, enjoys a drink, loves to barbecue, passionate. What? <laughs> um, and so I get back from Hawaii. I made a comment to a couple of people. This just came out of nowhere. I have been texting... I, I receive maybe two text messages a year. So I made this comment that, do people not text anymore? That same weekend, I got two guys' numbers. And I was thinking, okay, this is different. And then, lo and behold, in the past six weeks, I've got eight guys' numbers. Eight guys' numbers. One of them actually tends to ring me more than text me. And I just sit there like, what is happening? <laughs> so... It's been the most weirdest situation and I've been really open and honest about how, you know, manifesting and gratitude and everything else. But I feel like if you put some pen to paper and actually put out there into the universe what you're looking for, it comes back to you not quickly, but subconsciously you start realizing, holy shit, I requested this and it's happening. Out of those eight guys, those 12 dot points are kind of spread across all of them. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I'm not deep diving on anything. I don't care. Um, obviously, Jason Momoa has been the joke of my life. I definitely have a type, and that is someone that's like big, burly, beard, ponytail, not really too worried about, um, tattoos, that kind of thing. So <laughs> I obviously, you guys know I went to Calvin Crookshank on Thursday. I'll come back to that. We went out afterwards. We were dehydrated as all fuckery. I had necked a couple of drinks beforehand. I think they were vodka Cokes. God knows why I was drinking that. Had some Thai, went to Calvin. We were in this auditorium and it was super dehydrating. No one had any water. We were all making jokes. We should have smuggled wine into it. It was kind of the most weirdest three hours of my life. We go to the pub afterwards because it's karaoke night at the Victoria Arms Tavern. And <laughs> there's this farmer there who the week, two weeks prior I've met and he, I don't know, he's giving me kind of the side eye kind of thing. And I'm thinking, huh, I don't really remember saying too much to him, but I think he's just really shy and I don't really remember what we said. Anyway, uh, this guy, like his boss or something, he comes over to me and he says, do you mind if he has your number? And I'm just sitting there like like smiling like a Cheshire cat. Are you joking? This is like another guy that wants my number. Okay. So he says to me, oh, I want to take you out for dinner on Monday. I've been waiting for you to come back to the pub and I haven't seen you. And I was just thinking, are you, what? <laughs> okay. Um, And thinking, oh, you know, the bar staff, they wouldn't have had my number anyway because that hasn't happened. I've known them for so long. It's like, no, no, she'll be in here on those days. You don't have to get her number or anything. No. Um, so I thought that was really weird. And he's, he's sort of made a couple of comments about going back to his room and he's staying at the hotel there. And I'm thinking you're going to get bed bugs or syphilis or, you know, the, the hotel's haunted here at the Vic Arm. So <laughs> no chance. Anyway, Friday rolls around. I've got this little brown skirt, which kind of looks like a wrapped up bandage, like it's quite small. And I've got my tights, I've got my boots on, and I posted on social media off to the pub to see a farmer about a date. Because <laughs> by my understanding is he thinks he's having dinner with me on Monday. And I was like, am I going to actually go up to this guy and solidify this is even happening? Um get to the pub, having a couple of drinks, playing the raffles, the meat raffles on the Friday. And I don't know, it kind of like fizzled out until he walked in. <laughs> I 
And I was thinking, oh, far out. Here, here we go. Um, he sits with his mate. And I'm one of those people that will obviously throw the line out. Like, so I just sort of sat there and waited for him to approach. He was watching me the whole time. So I'm very aware that he knows that I'm there. And uh, he, I don't know, he gets up. He comes over to the table. And he stands there and he says, I'm going to go back to my room, have a shower. I'm going to leave the door unlocked. Feel free to join me. <laughs> guys, guys, my heart, my heart just like dropped out of my ass. Like, are you joking? <laughs> Is this my life right now? I have these timid, shy farmers that are offering me their hotel room because they're showering. They want me to join them. And I must have just looked so like scarcely blank, like what the frig? Um, and I can't even deal, you guys. He walked away with this big smile on his face, and I'm thinking back to my manifesting my husband list, and I'm thinking, if that wasn't confidence, I don't know what the fuck confidence is. Like honestly, that was just beautiful. So I said to my friend that I was with, it's nine thirty. I might just get a burger and go back to home and watch the Warriors play the Raiders, I think it was. And I look over to my right and these two blokes come stumbling through the door and I was like, oh, fuck, never mind. <laughs> and uh, I look down at my phone and I get this text from the farmer and he says, door's still unlocked, are you coming? And I was like, and I must have just looked around the table and they all just lit up like candlesticks, just like, oh, my God, Daddy. And I said, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and they were like, you go. The door code is da-da-da-da-da. You go to room seven. Um, I mean, that in itself was just such a, like, special moment. It was, A, I've barely spoken five sentences to this guy. B, he's offered to take me out for dinner on the Monday. C, he's offering me his bed and his shower tonight. And he's persistently wanting me to go back to his um, so it was really empowering and I thought, oh my God, is this, is this, what's going on? Uh, anyway, gets to the kind of end of the night and I've had a couple of drinks with the two guys that have come barreling through the door, one of which I know from high school and he's recently come back into my life. It's been a whole big thing. He's married, so it's fine. But I said to him, so what are we doing after this? Are we going to go anywhere? Um, because they're going to do last drinks and I want to grab some takeaways and let's not go down the path of having black, double black Smirnoffs again because I'll die. So he says, oh, no, we probably should just go home because we've got stuff to do tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, yep, cool. And I looked at him and I was like, maybe I should go to room number seven. And I was like, no. And he goes, you do what you want to do, Danny. I will not tell anyone. And I was like, no, 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 no it's fine. So I go outside to the courtesy coach and this random bloke comes up to me with a like a plastic bag full of waters, like not even just like pump bottle water, like some bougie Gibson Valley mineral water. And I'm standing there like, what are you doing with this? And he goes, oh, I've just come from work. I'm just taking it home. And I was like, it's like expensive water. And he says, I think he said $15 a bottle or something. And um, he says, do you want to come around for a drink? And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, the coach pulls up. Me and the two blokes jump in the back seat. We go out to this house, and I don't even know where it is. And the door swings open, and he says to us, get out of the coach, you're coming in for some drinks. And I was like, only if these two can come with me because I'm scared. <laughs> like, I need some support here, guys. And um, we go into this house party, and I swear to you, I've said this to you guys a million times, it's almost like a vortex. All of a sudden, it's four in the morning. And... Uh, I don't know what happened. We thought we were going to get skinned alive. There was like this weird stuff happening in this house. <laughs> we pop out the door at four in the morning and my friend has had to ring his wife who has come to find us somewhere near the Cromwell Golf Club uh, walking around just, I mean, I'm 1,700 steps into like this walk. That's what my Garmin watch said, thinking, what has happened? And um, what can I say about what happened at the house party? What what happens at the house party stays at the house party, I suppose. <laughs> um, I had to go back there on Sunday just to see the scene of the crime. And I was like, I kind of remember the house. Like I could find it if I thought about it. Nah, couldn't find it. Um, but it was kind of just one of those real spontaneous nights where I was still getting messages from the farmer. I was at this random house. This guy that I went to school with was there who was on the phone to a guy that 
he was in the same class with, like a video call. I'm yelling down the phone that I think he's cute. I wake up the next morning at 10 a.m. after all this, getting home at like half four. And I've got a friend request from the guy on the phone. And I'm like, what the hell? And I go into my messages and he's like, you still think I'm hot the next morning? And I was like, ah, oh, kind of. <laughs> so he's asked me out for a drink on Thursday. Um, I'm not really sure if that's really a thing because obviously I went to school then and I'm just like, do you remember me from school or are you actually interested in me or do you just want to catch up? Like what's going on? Um, I've got, you know, the farmer wanted to have dinner last night, but um, I don't know. I feel like even though he was quite forward about going to his hotel room, like I'm just not really about that. Like buy me a drink first, you know, get to know me. I I don't think I have it in me to be that spontaneous. <laughs> so I didn't, really initiate anything for Monday night that's for sure he's one of those guys that you look at and you're like is he hot or is it like is it, there's no conversation yet because we haven't really talked uh so the brown skirt from Friday night eh that energy was fire and I remember hearing from a few people and they were like I think it's the skirt and I said, is it too short because I can't work it out um yeah, I don't even know what to say about all this. The brown skirt, texting, getting numbers, it's just such an empowering feeling because I feel like I put it out there. I was I wanted to have people that were off social media contacting me. Honestly, I don't think I'm really sleeping that well at the moment just because I get excited because you don't want to go to sleep too early because you're like, who's going to text and you don't want to wake up too late because it's like, who's wanting to do something for like brunch? And that's where it's all going at the moment. I've had multiple like catch-ups, drinks, brunches, lunches, dinners. <sighs> I swear to you guys, I'm starting to feel like dessert at the moment. Um, Is there any one of them that I'm really keen on? Yes, one. One that I just can't seem to shake at the moment. I'm really like into. I mean, the, the chemistry is there. And I mean, I was making out with this guy and he kind of pushed me up against the fence and I felt this like power. And I was like, holy shit, um, not in a negative way, in a, I'm six foot three, so that kind of maybe may have felt really different, <laughs> uh, but taking it back to obviously my god mum and saying, you know, if you've got to be proud about someone that you meet and introduce them to us, none of these guys are taller than me, none of them, and for so many years I could honestly say I look at that as a real important part of this, you've got to be taller than me, you've got to make me feel special, I mean, now it's just all out the window, I laugh at these nights out, so many random things happen, I'm making so many new connections, and they're all about me, which is really unusual, I've never felt so spotlighted, like everything's just interesting, and people want to get to know me, it's never happened before, you guys. So <laughs> I am thrilled to throw this out there today and say I am actively dating. No one in particular, but just getting myself out there, which is a big step for me. In 37 years, I've never felt confident enough to do that kind of stuff. I think it's one of those growing pains as well. It comes with age, but and also in hindsight, I'm really proud of myself. My mindset's really clear. I have a lot of energy. I'm excited for the future. There's just interesting people in my life that want to get to know me, and I'm flattered. Uh, I'm flattered because it's the opposite sex, and I look at them and I'm like, this is just my favorite thing to do right now, is to go out, be social, see who I can meet, and um, see what the future holds, which I've never really been too thrilled about. Anyway, I kind of just coast along. You know, work's fine, family's fine, love interests, never been fine. <laughs> but I, I'm so deserving of this. And I think when I posted on my social media and said, hey, off to see a farmer about a date, waking up that next morning and having so many notifications and messages from all my friends and family, and they were like, are you joking? <laughs> and I was like, no. I didn't think there'd be this much hype and excitement and it's like my friends and family know that I just have never done this before, but they're all so supportive and ready for me just to announce something. And I'm like, when is that going to happen? I mean, I'm still sitting here manifesting my husband in the list. <laughs> no, anyway. So 
We did go to Calvin Crookshank. It was the weirdest three hours. Um, I feel like I should tell you guys, if you do manage to see the psychic medium around New Zealand, be one of the people that asks a question because then he does a reading on you. Uh, <clears throat> there was some weird stuff that came out of the woodwork in ours. Um, probably one of the bigger things to mention is that if someone you know has passed away, they they don't, like if they'd passed away because of an illness or a sickness or whatever, that they don't take that with them. So I don't know. I kind of just thought that, well, no, I've never really thought if you pass away, you still have like dementia or whatever, but it was kind of a big conversation piece that do you travel with that into the afterlife? And because I'm so big on the woo-woo because of my brother passing away and I just really wanted to know if he was okay, it was kind of like a really big, I don't know, heaviness on me. Um, I, I took a lot away from hearing from Calvin to know that there's different things that happen in your house that is definitely identification markers that they're still with you. And I was just sitting there like, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, a take, for example, I, I sometimes smell cigarette smoke or perfume, and I'm sure I brought this up before, but this is a new build house, so there's no reason for that shit. Um, but that's little indications of this, that, and the other. Or, you know, when you're driving along and you wonder how you got from A to B. Did you even pass it like a red light or, you know, that's someone guiding you. And it's just so interesting and wild to think that these are people that are helping us from past lives and things like that. So it was a really interesting three hours. But honestly, if you're not the one asking the questions and having the readings done, it's kind of boring because you're just sitting there like, well, I don't know that person. I don't know who that person was that passed away. And it's there was a, a really heavy topic about um, a, a bloke who lost his best mate to suicide. And that just broke the whole room. And it was interesting because my brother did that. And I just thought, there's a lot of um, questions I have. But uh, Calvin was quite quick to wrap it up at the end. And I was like, how do we find this shit out? <laughs> but I suppose I answer my own questions when I think about um, all the things that happened to myself. It's just... I mean, it all happens for a reason. Do I think that people are looking down on me right now and guiding me with this dating stuff? No. My nana would be absolutely absurdly <laughs> turning her nose up about all this at the moment. Um, I think it's just one of those confidence things. I'm happy. I'm putting myself in these types of positions. I'm talking to you guys about it. It's not trauma. Uh, I just think that it's almost like I've never really been taught how to date and I just have got to do this for myself. Um, put myself out there, go out, meet these people. I hate apps. I'm not on like any of those types of things except in Hawaii. I downloaded it for a laugh. It was a laugh, but it then got deleted. <laughs> um, but yeah, these are all the types of things that add up to me as a person and, and where it all comes from. So I hope this kind of clears a few things up. I think I've knocked off everything on my list to talk to you about about this. I feel like I'm going to miss something, but that's that's always the way it goes. I'll go and like make my breakfast toasty, um, and I'll be standing there thinking, far out, didn't mention that. <laughs> but anyway, if you guys have anything you want to ask or you have any advice for the next steps and all of this, please let me know. Honestly, this shit is happening in a small town for one little old person like myself, so... If it's happening to me and you're, you know, on the fence about a few things yourself, if it doesn't feel natural and right, it's not. So don't force it. The thing is, is that I go out every single time with a clear mind, no expectations. Everything's just completely relaxed and natural. And I'm just having the best time of my life. The best time of my life, you guys. I'm so happy to say that. Oh, my God, you have no idea. <laughs> anyway, love to you all. Speak to you again next week for podcast number 46. We are etching towards 50. Woohoo! <laughs>